Okay, so let's start now. Um, so uh, post midterm, basically, we are going to be doing two things. So first, we are going to wrap up uh, negative numbers and kind of arithmetic operations that we have started out on. And then rest of the course is going to go into circuits which have memory, the sequential circuits which we had introduced very early on. So I posted another module yesterday, so that would be, uh, we'll probably not come to it today, but we might. So uh, to kind of start, uh, something we had sort of started on uh, before the midterm, negative integers. Uh, so I want to go over that briefly again. So uh, through the midterm, we kind of looked at that bits can represent different things. Among, among different things, one of the things that a set of bits can represent is a positive binary number, an unsigned binary number. So kind of a conventional way of looking at it as unit place, two place, four place, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what about negative numbers? And eventually, if I give you n bits, then you have two to the power n unique bit patterns. And you could decide that some of them I'm going to use to represent negative numbers and some of them positive, but all of them representing positive numbers. And uh, there are many different ways one could do it. And as kind of I had talked about on last Monday's lecture, uh, some of them might be good in some regard, some not so. And a couple of obvious ones, uh, you know, well, one very obvious one which comes up in mind is if one were to be asked to represent negative numbers, it's the so-called sign magnitude, uh, which basically says that I'm going to use uh, one bit to represent the sign and remaining n minus one bits to represent uh, negative. So uh, to, to represent the magnitude. So uh, if I give you n bits, then one bit goes to sign. I have n minus one remaining bits. How many distinct numbers can I represent? With? If I give you n bits and we are using sign magnitude, how many distinct integers am I able to represent? Zero, minus one, minus one. Yeah, so that's the important part. Two pi minus one, minus one. So why is that other minus one? Because okay. okay, so someone else. So the answer is correct. So if I give you n bits, uh, one bit goes to sign, I have n minus one to be an a. Uh, so one would say, okay, so those n minus one bits can represent two to the power n minus one bit patterns. So, um, uh, so uh, two to the power n minus one magnitude and times two for the sign. So one would say two to the power n minus one. So uh, why do we have the addition minus one? Okay, so this. This thing obviously has a disadvantage that two different bit patterns are actually representing the same thing, and that can kind of confound your arithmetic operations. Again, okay, plus zero, minus zero would have different representations, even though they are the same. So you would like to kind of avoid that. Once complement. Once complement basically refers to that um, positive numbers are represented as they are, except that the most significant bit is going to be zero. So if I have n bits, positive numbers correspond to uh, the first bit being zero, and the remaining n minus one bits going from all zeros to all ones. And once complement of a number is basically subtracting uh, a number from all ones. So what I mean by that is, if for example, uh, uh, so once if I have a number zero one one. Zero one one zero. Then once complement means that uh, one way of looking at it is I invert everything, so this becomes one zero zero one. Okay, so I basically do a complement of that. Or another way of saying is I say one 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 all ones minus zero one one zero, and that is also one zero zero one. This is analogous to uh, in case of. Uh, Decimal arithmetic, it would be nines complement. So if I give you the number less than 76, then it's nines complement, it's going to be 99 minus 76, then it's 23. So uh, in any base, if you are looking at base n, then you can always define something as n minus 1 complement. So in base 10, you will have a nines complement. In base 2, you will have a ones complement. And the idea is that 
uh, if you take a positive number like I did 0 1 1 0 uh, then the corresponding negative number is the ones complement. So 0 1 1 0 is 6 so minus 6 in this case would be 1 0 0 1 in a ones complement notation. Uh, uh, in this case uh, again, we kind of hit the same problem that 0, 0, 0, 0, which is the number 0, its one's complement would be 1, 1, 1, 1, which would be minus 0, which is the same thing. So again, two numbers are being representing, uh, are being represented by the uh, same bit pattern. So one's complement was one of the techniques used, but again, the, doesn't turn out to be that great uh, for reasons such as that plus 0, minus 0 end up having different representations. So what caught on was two's complement, which we had started looking at last time, uh, and in base 10, the counterpart would be 10's complement. And the way two's complement is defined is uh, by way of an example. Um, so uh, if I look at uh, plus 23, so firstly, um, uh, 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 usually in these systems, n minus 1 bit get reserved for magnitude, so we will have 5 bits of magnitude, so 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 is 23, and then in sign magnitude, the first will add an extra bit for 0, and for minus 23, we will add a bit for 1 out here, so the magnitude part is the same in two cases. Once complement, Looks like I'm missing some slide out here. Okay. So that's sign magnitude. Once complement would translate to so I'll have the same 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 as my positive 23, but negative 23 is going to be uh, inverse of that, complement of that, or subtract it from all ones. So that would become uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, okay. Uh, so uh, one way of getting one's complement is, uh, let's pass it through an uh, inverter. Uh, oftentimes what happens is I may have to, I may decide to do uh, one's complement uh, only if I know the number is negative, so then in that case, we we'll pass it through an XOR gate, one input of that. One, so then you can uh, one input, the other input of the XOR gate would be zero or one, depending upon whether you want to complement it or not. So that's one's complement. Two's complement refers, uh, or analogously, tens complement refers to the fact that instead of uh, simply taking the invert, uh, I'm going to add one to it. Okay. So let's look and uh, look at it as an example. Uh, so two's complement basically means that if I have a number x, uh, in a number whose magnitude is x and it has a negative sign, then I'm going to represent it as 2 to the power n minus x, which is the same as saying 2 to the power n minus 1 minus x plus 1. And if you think of this, 2 to the power n minus 1 is nothing but an n bit number which is all 1s. So this part really represents the ones complement. And then we are adding one to it. So two's complement is nothing but taking the ones complement and adding one to it. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, or uh, another way of defining it is we take the in, take, basically take the complement of the whole number, add one to it, or uh, arithmetically it corresponds to two to the power n minus x where n bit numbers are being used. Uh, you'll see that this particular property leads to some uh, nice uh, arithmetic, nice way of doing arithmetic, uh, particularly addition and subtraction and all. So now the idea is the following that, uh, so I'm work, I've decided that my computer has n bits. I'm going to represent uh, numbers in two complement form. Um, following the rule that if whenever I have minus x, it will be math, uh, it will correspond to 2 to the power n minus x. 
But if I have n bits and if I feed it to an n bit adder, just our conventional adder that we learned previously, then what it really does is it does modulo uh, modulo n. Uh, modular to the part in arithmetic. So what I mean by that is, if I add, if, if so, go back to the adder which we kind of had uh, before the midterm. If I give you an n bit adder, and if I add two large numbers, uh, large enough numbers, then a carry out will go out. Okay. But if I look at the lower n bits and ignore the carry out, then that basically corresponds to doing addition modulo uh, two to the power n because I'm ignoring the bit. Uh, uh, the bit which was the carry out. The carry out bit would have uh, corresponded to uh, 2 to the power n. But then in this case, we get a wrong answer, actually, should be 33. So, let's uh, so have a second. You remember, also, the thing is, I'm not using n bits to represent, uh, as you will see, the, we are using only half the num half of the numbers, half, half of the numbers corresponding to n bits for positive numbers. Let's are going negative, okay? So we'll see that kind of flips out. So what I mean by that is, let's say I have four bits. I'm going to use 0, 0, 0, 0 <coughs> to 0, 1, 1, 1 to represent the positive numbers. And I'm going to use the remaining numbers to correspond to uh, uh, negative numbers. Now, when would the overflow or carry out of one happen? Well, if I take my two most, uh, uh, if I were to take, let's say, a number like 1000 and another 1000, okay, so that's 8 plus 860. That cannot be, in normal arithmetic, it cannot be represented in 4 bits. Uh, it would be all lower 4 bits to be 0 and 1 as a carryout, right? But what is 16 modulo to the power 4? It's 0, right? So, which is another way of saying is that I'm going to ignore the carryout. So, if I do arithmetic, with an n bit adder, and if I ignore the carry out, then it's as if I'm adding two positive, uh, and I'm using it to add positive numbers, and the effect is as if I'm doing addition modulo to the power n. That act of ignoring the carry out corresponds to doing an uh, operation modulo to the power n. Now, the reason it helps us out is the following. So if I now take, uh, so, so if you agree that n bit adder does, n bit adder adds positive numbers in a modulo to the power n fashion. Then if I were to have, if I were to have numbers x and then I had a negative number whose magnitude is y and it's negative, then as we agreed that 2's complement is defined as a that we say that minus y is represented by a number 2 to the power n minus y uh, in terms of our 2's complement. And if I were to now add this thing, x plus 2 to the power n minus y and feed it to an n bit adder, modulo 2 to the power n, I'm going to be left with x minus y because this 2 to the power n, uh, because of our modulo property will disappear. The only thing I have to make, uh, what, what it does limit is that I cannot use all my, uh, all my, all the possible 2 to the power n numbers for positive because I have to reserve some of them for negative. So in particular, for example, if, uh, if we go back to this wheel that we had seen before, uh, if I'm using four bits, then 0, 0, 0, 0 through 0, triple 1 correspond to positive numbers. But now if I look at the number 1, 0, 0, 0, that is actually negative 8. And the reason is that if I look at the number 8, which is 1, 0, 0, 0, if I take its two's complement, it becomes 0, oh, sorry, if I take it, if I take it once complement is 0, 1, 1, 1, and I add 1 to it, I'll get back 1, triple 0. So, or likewise, let's take minus 5, let's say. So, minus 5, well, first I take the number 5, which is what? 0, 1, 0, 1. I take its one complement, which is 1, 0, 1, 0, and then I add 1 to it, I get 1, 0, 1, 1. So, it's negative 5. And with a little bit of uh, sort of exhaustive thing, what you can see is that any num any four bit number whose upper bit is one is going to represent a negative number in this case. Okay, uh, and when it comes to zero, if I try to represent minus zero, so well zero 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 is plus zero. Its one's complement is one 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 one. And then its two's complement would be one 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 plus one, which is back to 
one followed by four zeros but we are going to ignore the uh, carry out so I'm going to be left with four zeros so this two's complement has a nice property that zero and minus zero are the same right so let's again kind of work it out if I take plus zero then that is zero 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 two's complement of this guy is going to be one 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 plus one which is going to be a carry out of one but the lower four bits are going to be zero and this we ignore so this is what we are left with so minus zero and plus zero are the same thing so it's uh, it has that nice property that one complement and uh, sign magnitude did not have so we have uh, of course a slightly asymmetric number system because on the positive side I only go up to 7 on negative side I only go up to uh, I, I go up to minus 8 and that's inevitable because if I have n bits I have an even number of distinct bit patterns if I am going to have a unique representation for 0 then I have to make a choice either I'll have more positive numbers or more negative numbers Two's complement uh, turns out to work well if I have more negative numbers then positive numbers so we go from minus 8 uh, uh, to 0. If I have generally n bits, so uh, uh, you will go to the most positive number would be the most significant bit being 0, the rest 1. So you have 0 followed by n minus 1, 1. That's the most positive number in a 2's complement representation. And most negative number would be the first bit position being 1 followed by all zeros, And that would represent the most negative number. And again, kind of going back to uh, the slide out here, uh, that act of doing uh, one's complement and adding one to it is the same as saying I'm doing two to the power minus two to the power n minus x in arithmetic terms, and and therefore the act of doing x and adding a negative, uh, taking x and adding a negative number to it is uh, because of this property that minus y is 2 to the power n minus y and my addition is modular 2 to the power n then this is uh, this is basically going to give me x minus y so what i mean by that is that if i use my regular adder i can use it to add two positive numbers a positive and a negative number two negative numbers what not as long as they are in my two complement representation so the same adder which previously we were using to add two unsigned numbers, two positive numbers, can now be used to add two two's complement numbers. And those two's complement numbers could be negative, positive, and the rest of So let's take an example. Let's say I have four minus three. So four is zero, one, zero, zero. And what is minus, uh, so I can say, uh, so four is zero, uh, one, zero, zero. What about minus three? So well, Firstly, 3 is, uh, minus 3 is going to be, so uh, so 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1. I take its complement, 1, 1, 0, 0. I add 1 to it, 1, 1, 0, 1. So minus 3 is 1, 1, 0, 1. And you can check on our table also. Minus 3 is 1, 1, 0, 1. Going back out here. So if I do 4 plus minus 3, I'm going to add it. So I'm going to get 1, 0, 1 plus 1 is 0 with a carry of 1, 1 plus 1 is 0 with a carry of 1, which I'm going to ignore. I'm going to look at only this guy, 0, 0, 0, 1, which in 2's complement representation is the number positive 1, which is what we would have expected because 4 minus 3 is positive 1. So I take, uh, we, we just, whenever I have a negative number, I start treating it as the corresponding positive number 2 to the power n minus x and then I use my regular adder and I kind of add them uh, and look at the output, solve the carry, look at the remaining thing and I'm going to get the sign uh, It kind of walks through this thing in details. Let's try another example. So I'm going to go back out here. Let's do, uh, let's say I want to add 4 plus minus 5. Okay, so we, we would expect the answer to be minus 1 in decimal term, in, in, in terms of their numeric value. 4, according to this table, is 0, 1, 0, 0. And minus 5, according to this table, is 1, 0, 1, 1. I add them, I get 1, 1, 1, 1. 
And what is 1, 1, 1, 1? It's out here, negative 1. So which is the same as negative 1. And you can try it for any pairs, and you would see it would work as long as you don't have an overflow or underflow. What I mean by that is, it could be that I try to add, let's say, 5 plus 5. 5 plus 5 is 10, but 10 cannot be represented in 4 bits. So in that case, I am going to see uh, if, uh, the, as long, so the result is not represented. Or for example, if I were to add minus 5 and minus 5, minus 5 plus minus 5, the answer would be minus 10. That is not expressible. Uh, so leaving aside this case of underflow or overflow, as long as I take two's complement number and if their value would add up to something that can be represented in our four bits, you would see that the answer would come out right. And the reason again is going back to uh, uh, this thing that negative numbers are nothing but 2 to the power n minus y and the adder is acting as a modulo 2 to the power n minus y. And of course the same thing kind of generalizes to other number of bits. So this property it turns out to be very nice that I can use the same adder which we were using thus far. And it's just how we think of the numbers. If I think of the numbers as representing positive integers only, 0 through 2 to the power n minus 1, it acts as uh, the same adder, um, uh, the adder acts as kind of a regular positive number adders. Uh, but if I think of the numbers according to two's complement interpretation, it acts as a two's complement adder. We don't have to design a new adder. Whereas with one's complement and sign magnitude, you will have to design a new adder because Part of the problem there is zeros get represented two different ways, which creates complication. So, so two's complement uh, again, uh, again to emphasize, it's defined as two's complement of a number is two to the power n minus x, or more generally, if you had, uh, if we were talking about decimal numbers and n complement, it would be ten to the power n minus x. Um, and one quick way of doing it is mentally doing it is first invert the number that is complement the number and then add one to it. So uh, because complement of a number is nothing but uh, subtracting it from 2 to the power n minus 1 and then when you add back a 1 that minus 1 disappears. So, uh, so rule is take one's complement and then add one. Okay, this is to get two's complement. And you can again reason about it that this is the same as doing this. So you should be very comfortable with going back and forth between two's complement and its number. But most importantly, this property that two's complement is nothing but doing two to the power n minus x is very important. Yes, so, um, so excellent question. So the thing is there are two ways digital arithmetic can get done. One is I give you like you know you are limited to n bits and if your answer doesn't fit into the n bits then you will your computer will flag an error saying there was an overflow the other alternative is that I realize that when I add two n bit numbers, the answer could generally be n plus one bits. So now I treat the carry out as an extra bit. But one has to be a bit careful there. Okay, carry out itself in this case is not the next bit. It will depend upon whether your output is negative, positive, or not. And we'll talk about it later. In regular, in regular positive integers, when you're adding, the carry out was just the next bit. Right? It's two's complement with additional condition. We talk about it. How to check if it's overflowing? Just hang on, we'll talk about it. Any other questions? Okay, so um, so this chart describes that. Now another way of thinking about it is if I tell you I have n bit numbers and that they represent two's complement numbers. Uh, numbers in two's complement format, and if I were to ask you for its arithmetic value, its innate numeric value, then it's the same as saying that for the lower bits, I'm going to weight them by their bit position, but for the upper bit, instead of, 
instead of weighing it by 2 to the power n minus 1, I'm going to weigh it by a negative of that. So what I mean by that is the following. Let's say I had the number 1011. If I were to tell you that this is unsigned binary number, then you would have said that I'm going to give this guy the weight of 0, this guy the weight of 2, sorry, weight of 1, 2, 4, and 8. And therefore, 1011 would correspond to 8 plus 2 plus 1, which is the number 11. And that makes sense. But if I were to say, so if this is just ordinary binary, ordinary binary number. If I were to say the same number 1011 represent 2's complement, 4 bit 2's complement, then we would say it has a weight of minus 8, 4, 2, and 1. And that would correspond to, in our case, a value of minus 8 plus 2 plus 1, which is equal to minus 5. And that you can see, uh, again, 1011 is minus 5. So given a particular bit pattern, this particular formula out here lets you calculate its numeric value. And all that means is that the weight for the MSB is negative as opposed to positive. Um, going back out here, uh, minus x is 2 for n minus x. So now let's say I give you a number, uh, a negative number, and I want, I want to say negative. Like if I give you minus 5, I want to get that 5. Right? So, so this thing told us that if I gave you 5, how to get minus 5. But let's say I gave you minus 5 and I want to get that 5, all into its complement, what would you do? Can you make use of that numerical property? Subtract 1 and negative 2. Subtract 1 and negate. Okay. Anyone else? Flip, it, flip the bit and add 1. You basically take 2's complement. Uh, same operation which took us from minus 5 to 5, you take us from 5 to 1. And you can see that works. Um, and the reason, again, has to do with the modular arithmetic. So you go back out here. Let's say I gave you minus 5, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay? So I'm giving minus 5, which is 1, 0, 1, 1. I complement it, so it becomes 0, 1, 0, 0. And then we add 1 to it, I get 0, 1, 0, 1, which is 5. So this relationship works both ways. Um, uh, 2's complement of a number, basically, uh, the act of taking a 2's complement is actually negating the number. So, you are, so 2 to the power n minus x. If x is positive, it will give me the corresponding negative number. If x is negative, it will give me the corresponding positive number. It's kind of works both ways. So uh, now, to take the 2's complement, as you can see intuitively, you have to invert and then you have to add 1 to it, right? Uh, um, an inefficient way conceivably of doing it is to use an adder to add 1, but we'll see that uh, things can be done a bit more efficiently. Okay, so now, uh, oftentimes in computers, uh, we... Oh, The previous formula, this formula, yeah. if, if, if I give you an n bit number and I tell you that this n bit number is a 2's complement number, you plug it into this formula, it gives you the numeric value for it. Okay, and see what's happening out here is if my first bit of the number, most significant bit, is 0, then this effect disappears and I'm basically left with a conventional binary representation. If this guy is negative, then uh, uh, then this will contribute uh, contribute to it, and that results in the corresponding negative number. It will give you the negative value. Okay. So in computers, of, oftentimes what we need to do is that I'll give you two numbers, and you'll have instruction to add them and instruction to subtract them. So I might want to do a plus b. I might want to do a minus b, and things like that. So often, so what we need is a hardware unit which could do 
as we command it, either a plus b or do a minus b. Now, a plus b, as we realize, for truth complement is just a regular addition. There is nothing special about it. For doing a minus, uh, and again, a and b are truth complement numbers, so they themselves could be positive or negative. If I'm doing on the other hand a minus b, we just learned that minus b is basically taking two's complement, right? It's complementing it and adding one to it. So the act of subtraction is nothing but taking the first number and adding to it two's complement of the second number. And these numbers themselves could be positive and negative. This little circuit out here does that. So if you think about it, if let so if sub is zero. So what the circuit does is, if sub is 0, then out equal to a plus b, else out equal to a minus b. That's the operation it is. Go ahead. How can the circuit take uh, one? Uh, excellent point. So these are stylized way of drawing things. So what this is saying is I have an NXOR gate. One input of all XOR gates is tied to sub, and the other input of the NXOR gates is getting the different vectors. Okay, and I think I think these kind of stylized ways you encounter, and just from the context, you you could, you, you, you could try to interpret. Right? So that's what's happening. So NXOR gates, one input of all of those XOR gates is tied to sub. The other input of each XOR gate is tied to a different bit, different bit of B. A and B in this case are two complements. Okay, A and B are uh, we are going to treat them as two complement numbers, so they are going to go from whatever most negative number being one, and n minus one zero, most positive number being zero, and n minus one one. So do we start using ten bit adders now? Pardon me? Do we start using ten bit adders now? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, unless stated otherwise, yeah. Okay. So then why don't we? Uh, so what we want to do is we want to create a circuit which can add those two numbers or subtract those two numbers depending upon what we want. <coughs> so like uh, those of you have done, uh, like let's say I declare two variables a and b. At some times I want to do a minus b, at other times I want to do a plus b. So this is a hardware unit which is capable of doing both and a and b are two complement numbers. Okay, so with this I could do like minus 5 plus minus 5. I can do minus 5 minus whatever, minus 5. I can subtract two negative numbers. I can add two negative numbers. All, all those combinations. A could be positive negative. B could be positive negative. And I could be doing an addition of the two or subtraction of B from A. In this case, can we understand that what it's doing is that absolute value of the input together? Uh, no. So what literally it is doing is it's either doing a plus b or it is doing a minus b depending upon what sub is. Oh, okay. Okay. So if sub is 0, it is doing this and what you can see what is happening is sub is 0, this all these XOR gates are just going to pass through b, right? XOR gate, if one input is 0, then the other output, uh, if it is 1, the output is 1, sorry, if the other input is 1, then the output is 1, if the other input is 0, output is 0, right? So XOR gate has the property that it passes through its other input if one of the input is 0. Agreed? Uh, so again, XOR gate is uh, X bar Y plus X Y, uh, X, X bar Y or uh, X Y bar. So if one of them is 0, the other passes through. If sub is 1, what do you think will be at the output of these XOR gates? Inverse of B. And if sub is 1, this carry in is 1. Correct? And therefore, whenever sub is 1, what we are really doing is we are doing A plus complement of B plus 1. Right? When sub is 1. If sub is 1, then this is what we are doing, A plus complement of B plus 1, but this is nothing but 2's complement of B, which is minus B. So by changing sub, if sub is 0, output is going to be A plus B, because carry in will be 0 and XOR gate will be a pass through, 
and if sub is 1, then I'm going to be doing a minus 3. So this hard this harder with adder plus this XOR gate is now capable of doing two operations. It's depending upon the control. So sub is like a control input. I make sub 0, this hardware does A plus B. I make sub equal to 1, this hardware does A minus B. And the adder itself is a good old adder, bunch of uh, uh, full address stacked up together. So the next slide kind of shows that uh, that this, uh, this 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 adder uh, uh, actually uh, is going to be just a bunch of full adders, each one of with them with a carry in and a carry out. Uh, ignore this XOR gate for the moment. Okay. So each so I have bunch of full adders. Uh, each full adder takes the corresponding bit position of A, A and B, and gets the uh, A and the output of the XOR gate, and takes a carry in from the previous stage. And at the zeroth stage, the carry in is coming from sub. So same adder as before, uh, before the bit stage. Now, the other thing uh, was the question, uh, which is how can we detect overflow? So, firstly, overflow is detected by looking at the carry out and looking at the carry in into the most significant bit and seeing whether the two are the same or different. So, again, this guy, this is the carry in into the nth bit, which is often called as penultimate carry. Penultimate in English refers to the one before the last or the one before the final. So I take my final carry. This is the final carry. And I take my penultimate carry and I XOR them and that will tell me whether an overflow happened or not. If the two are different, then an overflow happened. If the two are the same, an overflow does not happen. Now, uh, so usually you would see in computers, like at the lowest level, if you, those of you have done CS33 programming, uh, usually the, uh, they let you do an add, but then computers usually provide you a way to check whether an overflow happened or not. So after doing an addition, you can say, did the previous addition result in an overflow or underflow, then do something special. Uh, now, with two complement, overflow and underflow certainly can happen with four bits. If I were to add, let's say, 5 plus 6, I will plus the positive number 5 and the positive number 6, if I were to add it, I would expect to get positive number 11, but I am, I cannot represent it in 4 bits of 2's complement, so therefore I will have a problem. Now let's see whether for that particular example, where I'm adding 5 plus 6, whether our overflow strategy works. So, so firstly, 4 is, Positive 4 is 0, 1, 0, 0. Sorry, I was looking at 5 and 6, right? So, uh, so 5 is 0, 1, 0, 1. And 6 is 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay. Now, let's add them. So, addition, there's nothing special about addition. Uh, good old addition out here. So, 1 here, 1 here. 1 plus 1 is 0, I get a carry of 1, I get a 1 here and a carry out of 0. Okay, see how penultimate carry was 1 from here to here and final carry was 0, which according to our logic, if they are different, there is an overflow. And we do expect because 5 plus 6 is 11, which cannot be represented in 2's complement, so we did expect an overflow. Okay, so negative 12 plus negative 12 is negative 24. Now, firstly, you have a problem starting out. Negative 12 cannot be represented in 4 bits, right? So let's do something different. Let's do, let's say do negative 6 and negative 6. No, what I'm doing was negative 4 and negative 4. Oh, if you do negative, okay. So if you do negative 4 and negative 4, it will be negative 8. That should be represented, right? There should be nothing special about it. Let's try it. So, firstly, going back out here, negative 4, uh, 
the number minus 4 is 1100 okay so let's go back out here we do 1100 that's negative 4 I'm going to add it to 1100 0, 0, which is another negative 4 0 0 1 plus 1 is 0 with a carry out of 1 here 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1 carry out of 1 okay now both penultimate carry and final carry are 1 and therefore there is no overflow and that you see because and this is minus 8 so that's negative. so I'm not going to go through the proof of it although on algebra you can show it but uh, the overflow logic is that you look at the final carry and you look at the penultimate carry and if the two are the same then uh, no problem if the two are different then there is an overflow or an underflow okay uh, if uh, if you add two very negative numbers then same problem if you add two very positive numbers you can have overflow what about if the signs of the two numbers differ will you ever have an overflow or if I were to add them, if I were to subtract, I can have a problem, right? I mean, for example, I can say, take plus 7 and subtract minus 7 from it. Then, of course, I will have a, but if I'm doing an addition and the signs of the two numbers are different, then I would never have overflow. Uh, but this rule, uh, this overflow logic out here works for all cases. Uh, all you need to do is you look at the penultimate carry and the final carry, XOR them, and you get the overflow. Now, uh, but otherwise, this adder is just a regular adder. So the only special thing we need in this thing is to tap into this penultimate carry and then XOR it and spit it out as an overflow bit. And um, usually the logic, the way it goes is that when I add two numbers and if an overflow happens, then you will call some sort of an error function. And then do something special. So that's, that's what would happen in the Okay, uh, so now once now we have adder, we have subtractor. Once we have subtractor, we can do other kind of things. I can compare numbers. Comparison is nothing but subtraction, right? Uh, if I want to say is a greater than b, that's another way of saying is is a minus b positive. And a minus b being positive, the two complement simply refers to whether the upper bit is zero or not, right? If the upper bit is zero, it's a positive number. If the upper bit is negative, sorry. Is one, then it's a negative number. So if diff is negative, uh, if a minus b, we call it diff, and if a diff is negative, then a is less than b. Uh, otherwise, if diff is zero, uh, is a equal to b, and so on and so forth. So compar it, compar it, comparison could be done using subtraction. So once you have subtraction, other operations kind of open up uh, as a consequence. By the way, we had done a magnitude comparator before also, but that was a magnitude comparator for two positive numbers. Now you can begin to compare two signed numbers. A and B could be signed numbers. So two positive numbers. Okay, so we have seen addition, we have seen subtraction, uh, we have seen that how numbers could be interpreted to, uh, differently in just two complement ways so that they can represent negative numbers. So we can compare negative, positive and negative numbers, we can add them, we can subtract them. What about multiplication? So multiplication ultimately is an act of repeated addition, right? We, uh, okay. And also when we are taught non-multiplication, then we create partial products and we add them, right? I mean, so for example, if I were to multiply, I don't know, 76 and 43 in decimal, we kind of create two partial products. So I do 3 times 6, 18, 1 carry over, 21, so 228, and then I sh shift by 1, okay, so essentially give it an extra weight of 10, 4 times 6, 24, 2, 30, and then we add them, right, 6, 2, 3. So these things are called partial products.
And the other thing that's happening is each time I compute a partial product, it's shifted once to the left, one digit to the left, because it has an additional weight of 10. And the reason being the first partial product was formed by 3, which is in the units place. The second partial product is really saying, take the first number, multiply it by 40, 4 and the implied 10 because it's in the 10th position. So we shifted by that. So I have to compute a bunch of partial products and I have to add them. Same logic applies in phase 2, except uh, when I'm shifting by one position, it's really multiplied by 2 because base time 2. Now, If I, uh, sticking to decimal, if I were to multiply two two digit numbers, what's the largest value I can get? How many digits can the value be? So, two two digit numbers can give a number with up to how many digits? Four, three, five, one. So it be 99 times 99, right? And approximately, 100 times 100 is 5 digits, so less than that is 4 digits. What if I were to give you one number which is 2 digits, the other number which is let's say 4 digits? How many digits can the product have? Anyone? Ninety, uh, so ninety-nine times nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine, right? Roughly hundred times uh, ten thousand. So when you multiply two numbers, the number of digits add up. If I multiply a fifty-digit number and a sixty-digit number, the output can have as many as one hundred and ten digits, uh, and so on. Same rule applies in bits. If I multiply two two bit numbers, uh, I can have up to four bits. If I multiply and sorry, just a bit. So uh, immediately, I mean, one thing which comes up is the following: If I'm multiplying two numbers and I'm storing, producing the output, how many bits do I have available for the output? In computers, usually, like if you have a 32 bit computer, then your variables, whether they're input or output, they're all 32 bit. So Essentially, what it means is, depending upon the number values, I may have multiplicative overflow, right? I mean, if I give you two 32-bit numbers, multiply them, and I tell you, you can only store 32-bit again, then you are, in general, going to have overflow. But otherwise, the act of multiplication is this, form the partial products, and you add them up. So that's what we are going to do. So first observation, uh, in decimal arithmetic, shifting <coughs> to the left, meant multiplying by 10, right? So going back to this previous slide, uh, this 304 was really 304 shifted left by 1. So it was really 3040. In binary, shifting left by means multiplying by 2, because every bit was, uh, weight increases by a factor of 2. So if I have 5, which is 101, uh, now if I do uh, uh, 1010. Zero, one, zero. So I took this 101, one, shifted it left, and inserted a 0 in the LSP. I'll get 1010, zero, one, zero, and that's 10. <laughs> if I do the same thing again, 1010, one, zero, one, zero, I shift again by 1, 1010, zero, one, zero, zero, that's 20, and so on and so forth. So shifting left by k bits is equivalent to multiplying by 2 to the power k. Uh, what do you think shifting right by one bit means? Hmm? Dividing by two. Dividing by two, yeah. I mean, operation, okay. Ignoring for the moment that you may have a remainder lower, but it's going to be division. So shifting corresponds to multiplication and division. And by the way, these properties equally well apply to whether your number is positive number, or uh, as a regular binary positive number, or whether it's a uh, two's component. To multiply by three, so multiplying by three is nothing but adding the number to the twice of itself. So three x is nothing but x plus two x. So 
So one way of thinking about multiplication is I can break it up into a series of additions in terms of where the factors are powers of two. So if I want to multiply by five, then that's the same as x plus four x. I know I have x and four x is nothing but six to the left by two. Any given multiplier can be broken up into a, a, a multiplying and adding by different powers of two. So let's say we mul multiply seven and five. So seven is one, 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 and five is one, zero, one. And uh, again, with our analogy with long multiplication in decimal numbers, we can first multiply one, one, one by this one out here to the right, we'll get one, one, one. Next, I'm going to multiply by zero. One, one, one times zero is all zero, but shifted left by one position because this zero had a weight of two. And then finally, I 1, 1, 1 multiplied by the one in the most significant digit of the multiplier. That's another 1, 1, 1, but shifted by two position. And then you add them up, you will get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, which um, um, you can check out will correspond to kind of the right value. It's, this is 32 plus 3, 35. That's what we wanted. So multiplication is nothing but uh, uh, repeated addition because these partial products are very easy. Multiplying by one, a single digit bit one is nothing but what kind of operation? No. Uh, so if I were to say I'm, I'm giving you a number A and I want you to have the option of multiplying by one or multiplying by zero, what kind of logic would you use? Right? I mean, depending upon whether the bit here was 0 or 1, I'm either putting the number as is, the multiplicand appears in the partial product, or all 0 appears in the partial product. So what kind of gate has a property where, depending upon one bit, either I get all zeros or I get the other hand gate, right? So partial product is formed by an hand gate. Uh, I will have n, n, in this case, three hand gates. One input of each one of those AND gates is going to be tied to or is going to be controlled by the bit from the multiplier and the other bit is going to be from the multiplicand. So an AND gate lets me do the partial products and then I have to shift them. But shifting is nothing but, if I, if I tell you shift by one to the left, then that is nothing but a rewiring operation, right? I mean, I just relabel things. We saw it in the midterm also. Um, so it's just a rewiring operation. There's no, you don't need any logic just to shift by two. We just rewire things or relevel things. So multipliers can be formed by AND gates together with a bunch of additions after doing the shifting. Okay. So that looks like this. So to form a partial product. What we have is, uh, so I have two numbers, A and B, okay? The A's, which are the top number, so the top number is called the multiplicand. So the multiplicand we feed out here, A0, A1, A2, A3. Multiplier, which is the lower number, its bits are here, B0, V1, B2, B3. And at each intersection point, I do this AND operation. So this gate out here, this is A0 and B0. And this is nothing but in terms of our partial product corresponds to this bit, right? This is A0 and B0. Going back out here, this one is A1 and B0. This one is A2 and B0, and this is A3 and B0. And so this whole thing is the first partial product. And likewise, the second one is the second partial product, but see how I have drawn it. I have drawn it in a slanted fashion. 
so that things line up because we want the lower bit of the second partial product to line up with the uh, bit num uh, so zeroth bit of second partial product and bit number one of the first partial product they should be lined up uh, so so by just drawing things I'm showing that lining up happening so now if I were to and uh, so I have four partial products I'm going to add them up uh, so you would see uh, on this location just uh, first partial product contributes to so the LSB uh, for this one these two add up for the third one, three add up, and so on and so forth. So you create these partial products, and your goal is now going to be adding them up. And to add them up, you need adders. Needless to say, so on top of these AND gates, now I begin to need some uh, full adders. So what we do out here is the following. If I look at the lowest bit of my sum that would be nothing but the lower bit of the first partial product because it doesn't need to be added to anything if i look at the second bit of my sum that would be bit number one of first partial product and bit number zero of the second partial product they are added together so i have a full adder out here with a carry in of zero and that will come out here, but I also have a potential of a carry out because it could be that this bit is one and this bit is one. So one plus one, I'll get a zero, but I need a carry out of one. So I feed it to the left. And at each one of these intersection points, now I have a full adder, which is adding two bits of the partial product, taking a carry in from the right, product, producing a carry in to the left and putting the sum to the next one. So uh, let's, Go back out here. When I'm adding this thing, one 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 zero 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 one one one. What we are really doing is, if I think of this guy one zero one, I'm first going to add one plus zero, and I'm going to take its output, and then I'm going to add it to the next one. So if I want to add three numbers, uh, three bits, I first add two of them, and then I take its output and add it to the third one, and four, and so on and so forth. So that logic is being repeated out here. That each stage. The full adder adds the partial product at that location. The output from the previous stage, so like if I were to look at this guy, it's taking this partial product, it's taking the out sum of the bits above it, so it's getting the sum out here, it's taking a carry in from the right, it's producing the carry out, and it's supplying input to the next one. So I'm really kind of taking these uh, if I have n bits of multipliers and I'll have n partial products, in our case I have four partial products, and at each bit position I'm going to be adding them up pairwise. So I'm going to add the first two, feed its output to third row, take its output, feed it to the fourth row. So that's what's happening out here, and at each stage I'm taking the carry in from the right and I'm providing the carry out to the left. And then finally, you would see that this carry out is being fed to the full adder, full adder in the next bit position. Um, so this is kind of a multiplied structure that essentially replicates in binary what we do in decimal. That we add numbers, we feed, we feed and carry to the left, we take carry to the right, and by drawing it in this kind of a slanted way, we really kind of do it the way we right partial product expected to the left. It turns out that the very same multiplier would also work for uh, two complement number. There's nothing special needs to be done. Two complement multiplier is the same as a regular multiplier. Um, uh, so, uh, how many? Uh, how many uh, AND gates do I need in this? If I have, let's say, a multiplicand of n bits and a multiplier of m bits, so I have n bits of multiplicand, the first number, and m bits of second number. How many AND gates do I need? n times n. How many full adders do I need? n m minus n m minus n, right? Because the first row I want to know. How many output bits would I have? n plus n, right? So 
uh, up to eight minutes. So that's our multiplier. And since multiplication, yeah, what? Uh, has the carry of the previous stage has been fed into the carry of the next stage? So we feed it into the. Yeah, so at every stage, your goal is that carry out has to go to your left and your sum has to flow down. Okay? And. Uh, uh, and, and if you don't find anyone to your left, then you do go down there, okay? So like if you look at this guy, this carry out, there was nothing to its left, so we fed it down out here. So left and down. So carry out should go to the left column. Okay, first row. Okay. This guy? Uh, oh, this guy. Yeah. yeah, what do you want to do? Can we feed the carry out the second header into its, its, its zero, its B position? You're talking about this carry out? Yeah. So okay. I mean, the, this guy and then the, to the right. Oh, this guy? This guy. Uh huh. Uh, can we feed the. Oh, feed it to the B position? You could. Yeah. Because as far as the full error is concerned, carry in A and B, they are actually the same thing. They're just one one. So what his question is, excellent question. He's saying, instead of putting in a zero out here, could I, uh, could I have taken this guy and fed it to this input and then have a carry in of zero? That's fine too. You, th you should think of a full adder as really adding three one bit numbers. Can we interchange other wires? You could change other wires. Again, just remember, the thing to remember is carry out has a weight of an additional factor of 2. So it should go to the next column. That's the only thing that matters. How you add them up, uh, all the three inputs of full adder really are doing the same. So the full adder of B2 and A3, does it have a, have a sub of uh, Okay. Full, yeah, okay, 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 I know what you're saying. This guy, yeah, I think it, yeah. Oh, shoot. This is what it will be like. Thanks for that. Okay. So again, rule is, sum should go down in the same column, carry should go left, because it has a weight. And you could connect them in other ways. For the, um, this, for the comparison, um, use the header to make a comparison. But is it always. Actually, I use the subtraction. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But is it always better to make the delay equal? I mean, for the subtractor, if they are. One is positive and one is negative, we can um, tell them by looking at the. First you could optimize them. The thing is that uh, all those special cases may not be worth it because you are on your speed of your circuit, how fast it can block it, is going to be limited by the worst case data you have. So I know what you're saying. You're saying, look, if I have, if I give you A is positive and B is negative, then I know A is greater than B. I don't really need to do anything special. I can just look at the sign bit and do it. And yes, indeed you can. And in some circuits, you may choose to. But if you just start looking for a technique which just works always, just do A minus B. The only advantage of that circuit I see is that they have equal delay for different scenarios. Equal delay generally does not matter. Yeah. Equal delay generally does not matter in the digital circuit because we always wait for the next block tech. You'll see it later on uh, when you go into sequence. I've seen a discussion session that really said that equal delay can avoid hazards. You could, it has some advantages. Also, there are circuits where you can move faster if the result comes earlier. So, so in which case, the technique you have to listen has advantages. But generally speaking, that's not a reason that uh, drives it. You mean we don't necessarily encounter a hazard? Oh, you encounter hazards. You encounter many more things. But, uh, but uh, you don't 
you don't put special circuits. So like for example, what you're saying is, you know, to compare two numbers and I know A is positive, B is negative, can I short circuit everything else and just look at the sign? And I think it's, generally you will not bother going through that stuff. You will just use A minus B. No, 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 the halogen is just simpler. Any other questions before I can move on? So we're not going a whole lot of depth into multiplier, but uh, I, gazillions of papers and many, many, many hundreds of nan hours, if not more, efforts have been gone into optimizing multiplier. There are all sort of special multiplier structures that you will study in more advanced courses, boost multiplier, and there are all sort of fancy names because multiplication is usually uh, the slowest instruction in a computer. Actually, division is even slower, but division is so slow that it's usually not built in. It's emulated using multiplication. So the uh, instruction which is usually built in is multiplication, and since it's the most critical instruction, so a lot of effort goes into optimizing it. Uh, uh, but we are not, in this course, we are not going to go into those details. Okay, so integers we have covered now, so we can, we know how to represent if, if our task, if our, if our system only needs positive numbers that we did early on. Now we also know how to do things where there should be negative numbers and positive numbers. What about real numbers? So real numbers um, um, could be done in a couple of ways. So I'm sure in um, your physics courses or not when they talk about scientific notation and all, you would have seen the notation of numbers where you have a mantissa and an exponent. So like you write numbers as 2.1 times 10 to the power seven. And so that's the exponent part. Most calculators have that scientific notation. That's what's called as floating point. And what's meant by floating point is that the decimal point location is not fixed. It depends upon what your exponent value is. Uh, an alternative is that we decide that, look, I have five digits and I'm going to mandate that my decimal point is after the second digit, okay? And that would be called as a fixed point notation, that we pre-specify a fixed location of the decimal point or in tools looks, uh, in base two it would be the binary point. Um, uh, we pre-specify it as opposed to having a separate exponent. So, fixed point, uh, fixed point basically says that if I have n bits which go from b to the power n minus 1 through b to the power 0, we'll say that hey, our point is out here, some location out here. That's another way of saying, uh, so let's say I had some digits to uh, bits to the right, some bits to the left. That's another way of saying is that my weight for the bits are going from some minus uh, some position minus m to something out here, uh, which we are calling as n minus one. So, I instead of starting instead of the weight for the least significant bit being one, it is now one over two to the power n, right? Because to the right of the decimal, uh, right of the period, the weight goes as weight will go as one over two, one over four, one over eight, and then so on and so forth. So that's another way of saying is that weight starts from a negative power of 2. So that's what you are seeing out here, that uh, I go from i equal to some negative value to n minus 1. So in this particular case, I have m plus n bits. And I'm basically saying that I have m bits after the binary point or decimal point, and I have n bits to the left of it. Binary floating point, on the other hand, will have a mantissa multiplied by 2 to the power an exponent. And I'm going to represent the number as this mantissa value and an exponent value. Integers we already saw. And then there is also something called binary coded decimal. It's rarely used now. But binary coded decimal basically says that, you know, we are really fond of decimals, uh, base 10 numbers. We don't like to enter them. Humans like to enter them that way. So what we are going to do is, I'm going to represent each digit separately. So let's say, I want to represent the number 732. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent 7 as a set of bits, 3 as another set of bits, 2 as another set of bits. How many bits do I need to represent that 
decimal number or decimal digit four, right? So I would so uh, so in case of BCD, this guy. If I have the number 732, I'm going to represent it as 0111, 0011010010. And of course, uh, if I have signed, then I'm going to either put in a sign bit or I can do tense complement, uh, which is just an analogous to tooth complement. Yeah, so let's take an example. Let's say I have the number 1011.010. One, 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 that's our number. So the weight for this guy is 1, weight for this guy is 2, 4, 8, weight for this one is going to be half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth. Okay, and then you kind of multiply them. So uh, so this is 11 and a quarter, yeah. okay? And uh, our rules, it's just like the, uh, our base 10 thing, right? I mean, the first digit to the right of the decimal point has a weight of 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. It's exactly the same thing, it's just in, it's in power. <coughs> and again, to multiply this number by 2, what would you do? So let's take this 11.25, uh, which we get. If I want to multiply it by 2, firstly, what, what should I get? 11.25 times 2 is 22.5. Okay, now, previously we learned that multiply by 2 is what? Just left by 1. So that would become 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, dot 1, 0. Okay? And that kind of makes sense, right? So this is 22 and we have 0.5 out here. So binary fixed point is really like our integer. We just decided that uh -huh, this is where our decimal point is or binary point is, okay? There's nothing, no, nothing else. It's just an interpretation. There's nothing in the computer which says that, you know, this is the, that there is a particular way of storing a decimal point. It's just how you are interpreting, right? We have basically decided that we are doing regular integer arithmetic. We just decided that we are scaling everything by, in this particular case, dividing everything by an A. Okay, that's all that happens. If, if we had three bits to the right of the right point. So, again, kind of, it's how you interpret the result. It's the same hardware, same bits, nothing, nothing extra that the hardware itself has to do. It's your interpretation of it. Uh, binary coded decimal, on the other hand, is a special beast. Uh, and again, Com rarely do computers natively support it, but BCD is usually found in user interfaces and all because like we like to represent numbers in decimal form. If you are going to dump, like going back to our design homework, if you are going to dump uh, display temperature in hexadecimal or binary, the user will have a hard time. So you have to kind of go back to the decimal number to kind of display it. So going back and forth between the world of decimal and the world of binary is needed at the edges, when you're inputting stuff or when you're outputting stuff. Um, if I were to give you a binary coded decimal number like this, and I were to ask you, give me its binary representation, what would you do? So let's say I give you three digit BCD, so three decimal digits, like the number 732. And I were to say, you have to give me its binary representation. Firstly, three digits, how many bits do you need? In binary representation. For, for BCD representation, I need three times four, 12 bits, okay? But for binary representation, how many bits will you need? Hmm? Well, three digits, 732 is just an example. So what's the largest number I can represent in three, 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 uh, three, three decimal digits? 999. So I will take log two of that. How many bits? Two. Maybe 10 bits, okay? Uh, let's 
So 10 bits, whereas in BCD representation, I needed 12 bits, right? Four times three. Okay, so three ten bits. Now, let's say we were, I gave you this number, a specific BCD number, and I say, okay, now give me its binary representation. What do you have to do? Well, it's already in decimal in a way, right? I mean, because I gave you for each digit, like in my example of 732, I gave you the binary representation of 7, I gave you the binary representation of 3, and I gave you the binary representation of 2, right? But now I want the binary representation of 732. You should each digit by place. You shift each digit in its place, but shift will only multiply by 2. You're kind of on the right track. So if I give you 732, what is its value? It's 7 times 100 plus 3 times 10 plus 2, right? If I give you three digits, D3, D2, D1, three decimal digits, then its value is D3 times 100 plus D2 times 10 plus D1. That's exactly what you have to do here, right? So I'll, if I do, 0, 1, 1 times 100, 100 in base 10, plus 0, 0, 1, 1, so I'm going to write the bases, base 2, base 2, times 10 in base 10, plus 0, 0, 1, 0, times 1 in base 10. That's the operation I need to do. So, Let's take 0, 0, 1, 1. I need to multiply it by 10. Huh? I could use multiply. Could you do it more efficiently? See, multiply is kind of an overkill. Multiply, multiply is two variables. Here, I know I have to multiply only by 10. So could you express multiplication by 10 as a bunch of shift by 2, shift and add? So what is 10? 10 is 8 plus 2. Right? So multiplying by 10 is take the number, shift it by 1, and then shift it further by 2 more and add the quotient. Right? So if I have x, my, my, I want to multiply by 10, that's the same as saying 2x plus 8x. 2x is x shifted left by 1, 8x is x shifted left by 3. And then we can add it. What's 100? Can you express 100 in a similar way? Of shift by powers of, uh, or whatever, multiply by powers of 2. So 100 is 64 and 4, right? So 64 is shift by how much? 64 is shift by 6, 32 is shift by 5, and 4 is shift by 2. So I can do 100 times uh, my 4 digit number by basically. Three, uh, three different shifts and adding them up. Uh, multiply by 10, 8 and 2, and of course the lower digit is non digit. So I can basically kind of do this, express things in powers, powers of 2, and then kind of add them up. So I could have used a multiplier, but multiplier, you really need a multiplier when you are multiplying two variables, where both the values are unknown. But when you know one of the values, when you know the multiplier, then you really don't need a full blown multiplier. Uh, full, uh, when you need, when you know one of the numbers, uh, multiplicand and kind of multiplying the second number, then you don't need a full full blown multiplier. But you could do it much more efficiently. So, going from given the binary, uh, given the decimal digits, each one of them is a four bit number, going to a binary value is relatively straightforward. Going the reverse way is very hard. Let's say I want to give you the number. 15 in binary, so that's what? 1, 1, 1, 1. What is 15 in BCD? Uh, 15 is 1 of the first digit is 1, so it's 0, 0, 0, 1. Second digit is 5, so it should be 0, 1, 0, 1. Going from 1, 1, 1, 1 to this 8 bit representation of 15 is not easy. Uh, it's 
usually convoluted arithmetic. I mean, it's done, there are algorithms for it, but it requires a lot more thinking. So going from BCD to binary is easy. Going from binary to BCD is tricky. Uh, if you were to do it for sign, yeah, it's a bit more complicated even. Uh, uh, so that's BCD. And again, it's usually done at the edges. Your computer hardware itself, you don't, you don't design BCD adders or BCD multipliers. Uh, you just don't do them, although you could, could have some early computers in 17 were like that, but nowadays you take care of it at the edges. Uh, binary integer we have seen. Binary fixed point, as we decided, is just a chain in frame. You basically say, I'm going to think of my integers instead of integers as being scaled by, in my example, with the speed is a bit as by factor of eight. So, and then I kind of carry that information. Binary floating point is the complicated stuff. Okay, here I start thinking of numbers in scientific notation. So I'll have the mantissa, I'll have, so scientific notation again, kind of our calculators have things like 76 uh, E3. That is the same as 76 times 10 to the power three. It's the same logic. So this is called mantissa, and this is called the exponent. In binary floating point, in mantissa and exponent are binary numbers, and they could be signed. They could be so binary floating point. Binary fixed point looks like this, for example. Binary floating point would have a mantissa and an exponent. And, um, and binary floating point is complicated enough that it has been the subject of entire standards. Uh, part of the problem is it could be done many different ways. And for computers to be able to exchange data and all, uh, it's more important that they agree on a common standard. It's supremely complicated, uh, nevertheless very important because scientific computation relies, relies on it. And in fact, even in 32-bit computers, if they have floating point, if the floating point itself would be 64 bits. So it takes two 32-bit volumes. Uh, you have uh, in our 64 bit computers, floating point is often uh, in terms of 128 bits. In our programming languages, you have float and double. Both of them are real numbers. Anyone knows the difference? First thing you have any one of you encountered float and double. When do you use double? When do you use float? Yeah, so, okay, so if you want more digits, so more digits in my mantissa, I need that. Also, if my exponent can be very large or very small, also, then also. So double you need when your numbers can vary over a large range and you need higher resolution. It, uh, so on a 32-bit computer, doubles need 64 bits. Float need 32 bits, so they are more compact, but then their range and resolution is small. So float is cheaper. Um, double is a lot more expensive, but then again, for a lot of scientific engineering calculations, you need double. In some, oh, go ahead. So for your binary float, is it the decimal point always split into four and four and three? The standards do that. There is nothing that says that it should be that way, but it's a common way of doing it. So the question there was that, is it always the case that, if you go back out here, if you see this point, the decimal point, or I guess binary point, is to the leftmost thing, okay? And the question was, is it always like that? Uh, it's very commonly like that. There is nothing mathematically that says it should be like that. Um, you, I could have, one could design hardware and saying, okay, it's up to the first bit, for example, and that's fine too. But standards have chosen things in a particular way, and it's very common to be done. Um, you're right, you could think of it as a fixed point number, except that the fixed point number is one where the binary bit is to the network position, and then where the variable is. Absolutely. 
The standards are a little bit more complicated. Uh, like for example, here you would see that they have some additional term, terms out here. Uh, again, uh, just just to uh, just to put it in perspective, the person who helped define much of the theory or standard behind this IEEE 754 floating point representation uh, is a I probably now retired professor at Berkeley, uh, William Cahan. He got a Turing Award for that accomplishment. Anyone know what Turing Award is? Kind of a Nobel Prize in computer science. Okay. It's a very significant thing, partly because it just made a huge impact on essentially making large scale scientific computation, whatever simulation of weather and nuclear armaments and all kind of possible uh, in a very standardized way. So a uh, lot of effort has gone and both from hardware design, its standardization, better algorithms, all sorts of things because uh, just a lot of large scale modeling and science depends on that. Again, way too complicated for us to kind of go further in this course. There is a graduate course in computer science department taught by Professor Milos Erzogovic, which is titled Computer Arithmetic. So that entire course is about uh, circuit specialized for computer arithmetic, faster circuits. Uh, okay, so then what, as, a, as, a, as a system designer or as a software programmer, uh, one thing which usually you encounter is how should you represent things. Now, one could take a lazy approach and say, hey, you know, I'm going to represent, I'm going to use double for everything and I'm going to just use multipliers and uh, Mr. Fosley operations. The problem is very soon you kind of, uh, your, your code kind of just looks up. Uh, and in many cases, like particularly, uh, like think of like people who design uh, code or chips for doing very like HDTV or 4K video resolution and all, there's just too much computation going on. And if you start doing everything in these floating point representations and all, uh, it becomes very expensive. So a lot of design effort goes into actually keeping things the simplest possible. If you can get away with integers or fixed points and not have to use real numbers, you should probably do that. The problem is oftentimes we don't know where that decimal point is. And that's when we start going towards real number of floating points. So that's one reason. I may not know where my decimal point lies. My numbers may range from very small to very large, called dynamic range. So, uh, so uh, I, at different times, some data coming from some sort of sensor may be very tiny, in which case I may want all my bits to be after the decimal point. And at other times, it may be very large in value, in which case I may want all my bits to the left of the decimal point. So if my decimal point you know, keeps changing, then I need, uh, so, so my maximum value and minimum value are very high ratio, then real numbers become very expensive to use. But they come at a huge cost, because doing multiplication addition is very expensive. Can you what? Can you log it to normalize it? Okay, so excellent point. So log as uh, uh, because log helps reduce, uh, compact the numbers, and in many cases it is done. The problem is going to log and back is not cheap. Okay, so that is quite uh, But people have tried all these kind of things. People go to different bases. Uh, there are tertiary bases used. So I mean, just the amount of effort which has gone into optimizing computer arithmetic is amazing because just so many things depend upon it. Your wireless communication, your Ethernet, your uh, audio, video processing, sensor process, all of these things deep down are various kind of computer arithmetic being done at very high rate. Okay, so this, this lot of effort has gone. Again, uh, in this course, we really cannot sort of even begin to touch that. Okay. Um, if you want to represent, let's say, temperatures, uh, 0 to 100 degrees Celsius in 0.1 degree resolution, some sort of a temperature sensor given this. You might say, okay, it's a real number, let's just use uh, uh, double, but it will be a way overkill because we have given you a lot of information. 0 to 100 in 0.1 degree thing, so I know the uh, range, I know the resolution, I can probably map it into some sort of a fixed point representation and be done with it. Okay, first thing I'll start out by saying is, 
0 to 100 in 0.1 degree Celsius is the same as 0 to 1000 in 1 degree Celsius, right? So immediately I can convert it into uh, integer problem and mentally say, let's keep track of this factor of 10 separately. And then 1 to 1000, I can represent as integer with how many bits? 10 bits, right? So 10 bits and then this known scaling factor of factor of 10 separately. So I can do this thing all via integer arithmetic. Uh, 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 with this. On the other hand, I may choose to say, okay, you know, I'm going to be lazy, I'm going to represent it using real or float or double and kind of work with that. So, and it will have its disadvantages. So, I could do floating point and all, and these kind of decisions you kind of end up making. Um, so, anyway, we saw its depth how to do integers and positive and negative numbers. We got into uh, we take multiplication and of course addition and uh, 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 subtraction. We didn't do division. How would you do division? How do we do long division? Okay, so let's say, uh, let, let's think of it. So let's say I want to multiply, I know multi multiply two numbers, we know the shift and add part of it. When we have to divide two numbers, so let's start with in, uh, two integers. So we have to divide 75 by 11. How do you do it? Some algorithm, let's say, and all you know thus far are plus, minus, multiple. So suggest some strategy. How is division defined actually? What is division? When we say 75 divided by 11, what are we really asking for? How many 11s are there in 75, right? Okay, so one strategy could be if I multiply it, I can try multiplying by 1, 2, 3, 4, until I just exceed 75. Okay, that could be very slow. And I'm using a multiplier, so it's very efficient. Okay, what else can I do? Okay, keep on subtracting. So that's going to be good. Subtractor is cheap, much cheaper than multiplier. So 75 minus 11, whatever answer, a little greater than zero. Keep going until you stop zero. So I can do that. That works. Uh, the only thing is I need n steps. Okay, how do we do long division? So let's say I divide 769 by 9. Let's start with that. How do we do that? <coughs> Come on. This is, I don't know, sixth grade, fifth grade stuff. We forgot, right? How do we do it? <laughs> okay. So what do you want me to do? Uh -huh. Right. So I don't know. I was taught this way. You draw it like this and like this and like you are saying. I try with seven. Doesn't work. I go with seventy six. How many nines are seventy six? So you remember some basic stuff. So uh, nine times eight. Uh, so I put that out here. Seventy two. I do a subtraction. Four nine. How many? Right. That's that's how we do it. Essentially, what we are doing is we are doing, uh, we are looking at these little pairs and, uh, and kind of subtracting and repeated subtraction. So this is a process that you could emulate algorithmically and do it in binary terms. Same, kind of similar story. Too complicated for me to go into, it's not part of the course, but just wanted to tell you that the people make dividers, okay, and this is how you do it. Now, an idea which was thrown out earlier was log. So what does multiplication and division, what do they become in long domain? Multiplication of two numbers is the same as add of log or division becomes subtract of log. So one of the reasons some of, some of the computers have chosen to go into log domain, if they do a lot of, if your algorithm has a lot of logs, a lot of multiplication or division, then upfront cost of doing a log and then doing addition multiplication and then reverting back to an anti-log becomes quite good. So 
So all sort of techniques get applied. The very first digital computer uh, of the modern era was basically made in 40s for missile computation, missile trajectory computation, uh, cannonball trajectory computation, World War II. So they were doing a lot of trigonometric computation and multiplication and division, kind of usual physics stuff. So they were using those kind of tricks for us. Nowadays, it's like you just calculate log n, empty log when you need it using some series computation. Your computer will not provide the Anyway, so we're going to stop out here. Um, I don't think I have any more slides on this one, do I? Yeah. Uh, so we are going to start on sequential logic.